Um, so uh, my task is that within the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the religion of Islam. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, 20. All right. So uh, a, a little bit of breathing room. Um, so what I'd like to do is hopefully give an overview on a conceptual level, not getting down into specifics, but more giving you a bird's eye view um, to sort of look at what the... The, the, the box of the puzzle you know, shows you that, that image, because um, sometimes we can look at individual pieces and, and lose sight of, of what the whole thing is. So um, that's, that's my uh, hope here today. So first I'd like to start with some definitions. Um, so first two, what is the, the term Islam? Mean? So Islam is the proper name of the religion itself. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I am. <laughs> I'm going to stand just because I, I kind of need to see where the slides are, so, with your permission. Uh, it's the proper name of the religion itself, right? So uh, it's a word that means literally to turn oneself over to, right? Uh, it is to surrender over to, and it means obviously to surrender oneself over to God. A Muslim is therefore one who has surrendered himself or herself over to God. Uh, it's uh, one who achieves, and, and the word Islam also comes from a root word that means peace. Um, so you sometimes you might have heard that phrase where some people say Islam actually means peace. Yeah, the word Salam, and even the Hebrew Shalom in Semitic languages, means peace. And so what it means is that when a person surrenders him or herself over to God, they attain peace within themselves and, and, uh, and, and are able to uh, emanate that peace throughout, throughout the world, hopefully. Uh, but a Muslim is not a, a person of any specific race or ethnicity. There are people from all walks of life. There's, a, there's Muslims of every ethnicity on earth. And I've got some pictures up here um, to sort of illustrate that, some sort of more famous and well-known uh, people. But you, there's anybody, I mean, the, the, the first one I think is probably one of the most recognizable faces in, in, in modern history. But Muhammad Ali, who we all know of, um, an American uh, Muslim uh, who just passed away just a few years ago, uh, Cat Stevens, who converted and took on the name Yusuf Islam, um, and then Dr. Oz. You, you have many famous um, athletes and, and, and uh, many people that we know that we may not know are Muslim, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessitate any particular uh, race or ethnicity. It's just one who surrenders himself over to God. Another definition I think is important to consider is the word Allah, right? Who is Allah? What does that mean? Is that, is that a deity that Muslims worship? Um, Muslims, it is simply the Arabic name for God, the God of Abraham. Um, the, in, in the Quran, you will see that the, 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 re, the, the returning point for all conversations, particularly with Jews and Christians, is Abraham. Abraham is considered the, the, the father of, of monotheism as we know it, sort of spread around the world. And if you go back to Arabic translations of the Bible, that right there is Genesis in Arabic. And if anyone here could read Arabic, you'd see the fourth word says, uh, That in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. Right? So Christians will call upon Allah. So it's simply the Arabic term. It's not a different God. It's the same God that sent Abraham, Noah, uh, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, we, we believe that it's the same God. So Muslims uh, often are, are uh, framed as worshipping another God, which, which, is, uh, which is false. So how does Islam view itself vis-a-vis -vis other religions is an important question. Uh, like I've already mentioned, Muslims see the returning point uh, of all theological conversation to be Abraham. Um, so they see themselves as continuing and not replacing. They're, they're, they're not a, it's interesting, there's actually a verse in the Quran where God says to the Prophet Muhammad, you are not anything new amongst the prophets. You're not bringing anything new per se. This isn't anything different. Um, but that he is a culmination of the previous messages. Um, so there's a, 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 a one way that some Muslim academics, uh, and actually non-Muslim academics, frame this, that Muslims believe in Islam with a capital I, and that's the religion that we follow here, here in a mosque, but they also believe in an Islam with a lowercase i. That all of these other traditions and previous revelations were manifestations of a surrendering to God of that time. Right? So that if you were a follower of Noah on the ark, that you were in a state of Islam, surrendering to God and following his commandments. And you were therefore a Muslim with a lowercase m. 
one who was living in surrender to God. If you were with Moses standing against Pharaoh, right, then you were in a state of Islam, surrendering to God, etc. So, um, so that's an important concept that, that's not seen as something foreign or different. Um, now there's an interesting uh, uh, parable that the Prophet Muhammad gives, peace be upon him. He says that the parable of my coming is like a beautiful building. And everyone is walking around this beautiful edifice and they're saying, what a wondrous building, what beautiful architecture, except it's just missing that last brick. And he says, I am that final brick. And so his message to us in that is that this is all a culmination of what previous prophets have brought. That he doesn't, that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad could have said, um, everything is corrupt. My parable is like a bulldozer that comes and removes everything. But he didn't. He said, I am just that final brick. Um, and so that's, that helps us to understand how Islam views other faith traditions as part of God's plan um, that were uh, an indispensable part of his, of his mission and his coming. There's another interesting tradition in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, talks about the fact that there was no community on earth in the history of humanity to which God did not send guidance, even if we don't know who they are or in what form it took. And he says that the over 124,000 prophets were sent. So the Aborigine, uh, Abor, Aboriginal peoples of Australia must have had a prophet that was sent to them. Someone that told them simply about God, the creator of the universe. All of these were different levels of completion. Sometimes it was very basic. Like, for example, the Noahidic laws, right, are much simpler than what Moses brings, right? The rabbinical legal code is far more complex. But they all include one God, don't kill, don't steal, right? Don't set up idols alongside God. The Ten Commandments are almost something universal to all of the Abrahamic faiths. And in some form exists even in other faith traditions. So in order to understand Islam, and I mean with a capital I now, uh, the religion you came to learn about today, right? There are three main dimensions to learn about the religion, okay? So the quiz at the end of today will be based on these three. Okay. So, uh, faith, conduct, and character. So I'm going to start talking about conduct. So if you've heard of the five, who here has heard of the five pillars of Islam? So the five pillars of Islam, about half of you, the five pillars actually only summarize uh, conduct. So these are actions that a Muslim must perform. These are the five basic uh, rites and rituals that every Muslim has to perform in order to be minimally performing. So the first are the two testimonies of faith. These are the two statements that if a person believes and proclaims, that enters them into Islam. There's no baptism, there's no formal ceremony or anything like that. If a person says, I believe that there's nothing worthy, worship, worthy of worship, save God, and I believe that Muhammad is his last and final messenger, that alone would qualify someone to be a Muslim. Okay, so, but the first pillar is to make that testimony. Thereafter, we have five daily prayers based on the position of the sun in relation to where we are. There's a dawn prayer, there's a midday prayer, there's an afternoon prayer, there's a sunset prayer, and then there's a night prayer. And these are five points throughout the day that we spiritually realign ourselves with our purpose and our creator. Uh, one of the amazing things uh, about human beings uh, there's a there's a, a, a British Muslim scholar who has a, a, a great proverb who said how easy it is to forget how easy it is to forget right we're just forgetful beings we realign we wake up in the morning okay God I'm just oh what's my to do list for today right so we have five points of the day in which we realign we remind ourselves we recenter um, and, and and these things are, are are there for us to guide us throughout the rest of the day. Called. And this is that every Muslim gives 2.5% of their savings, not their income, but their leftover savings, their excess wealth um, that sits around in a bank account to be given to the, uh, to the needy and, and, and the less fortunate. Uh, the fourth is fasting the month of Ramadan. So there's a lunar, we follow a lunar calendar, um, and in, there's a month, it's the ninth month, called Ramadan. And how many people have heard of Ramadan? Just, I get curious to know what people are. Okay, that's it's good. So it's to fast. No water, drink, uh, no food, water, or intimacy um, from dawn until sunset. All right, and that's currently at a, in in, a, in about June, May June right now. So they're you know relatively long days. Um, and then the last is the pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. So Mecca is a city. Uh, it was alluded to by by our sister Hina. 
uh, that it's in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Anybody know who founded the city of Mecca? Any guesses? His name has already been said. Abraham. Abraham. So Abraham, it's actually in the Bible, it's called Becca with the B. He goes to the holy city of Becca, and that's where he lives, Ishmael, uh, and, and, and Hagar, right? And there's a famous story of the well that Ishmael finds, etc. That's all there in the Old Testament, but that's where we make pilgrimage to, to the house that was uh, erected by Abraham for the worship of the one God, and that's the holiest site of the psalm. So that's conduct. Those are five ritual devotions that every Muslim must practice and be committed to as a minimum. Um, then there are faith. Then, the, then there's faith. Not things that we do, but things that we believe. Okay? These are things, this is surrendering to God with our bodies, but then also with our mind. Right? Things that we believe are mental conceptions. If you believe the earth is flat, or you believe the earth is a sphere, it has to correlate to truth and reality. Those are conceptualizations. So these are five realities that every Muslim must believe. That you must believe that there is God. You must believe that he's a reality, that he created uh, the, the, the world, that he, was, he precedes time, he's outside of time and space. He created time and space and the heavens and the earth, etc. We believe in angels, that these aren't metaphorical beings, that there are really beings that exist in another dimension, right, beyond our own, but that interact uh, in our dimension by God's command. We also believe in divine scripture, that God communicates with his creation, that he created us for a divine wisdom and purpose to know him and to serve him. But then he communicates this purpose to us through a succession of prophets. Okay, and that they all essentially came with the same message. Right, when I say essentially, the particulars might differ because that differs with time and place, but their message was essentially the same. God created us, worship him, know him, right, and live in accordance with, with, with morality. Okay, so we believe Every Muslim has to believe that the Torah was divinely revealed, that the Psalms were divinely revealed, that the Gospel is divinely re revealed, and lastly, the Quran. Where Muslims may differ from their sister faiths is that uh, the accuracy and authenticity can sometimes fall into question. One of the things that the Quran says is that men, we know that religion is great, but sometimes institutions of religion aren't always perfect, right? And that men alter things with their hands, and then so God says, well, I'm going to send another revelation to set the record straight, that's not what I said, etc. But with the final revelation, God promises a divine protection from alteration. And we can talk more about that uh, perhaps afterwards. Some of the historical um, evidence of that that's come up recently, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the fourth reality you have to believe in are messengers, that God has sent messengers. We've talked about that already. One thing that's worth noting is that for Muslims, our conception of Jesus, our Christology, is, that, is closer to a Unitarian understanding. That God sent Jesus as the Messiah. He was born of a virgin birth, and he performed these miracles, and he resurrected the dead, and all of these things. Uh, but he came as a prophet, and not as part of uh, a, a trinity. He was not God incarnated. He was the Son of God metaphorically. Not God the Son, but the Son of God, the way that phrase was used by the Hebrews of the time to refer to a godly person. Um, so we hold him to be a mortal prophet who will return at the end of times. He is the awaited Messiah. So, for example, um, if the Orthodox Jews don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, they're still awaiting the Messiah, the Muslims would differ and say, no, he was the Messiah, and those who were present at the time had to follow him in order to be Muslims, right, lowercase m, uh, but that he, he, he was a mortal prophet. Uh, and then the fifth reality is to believe that we are all going to meet our maker and to be held accountable. For our actions. That some people can get away with things here in this world, but nobody ultimately gets away with them. But we, we, we pray for God's mercy on that day. Sorry, the last one, this is clicker not participating, is divine decree. One of the things that Muslims believe is that nothing in creation happens without God's willing it and allowing it to be so. Nothing is outside of his power. Good things and bad things happen with God's permission. Because this world was created we're for a mixture of good and evil. It's a testing ground of our morality and of our free will. And bad things happening is inseparable from free will, but that doesn't indicate that God is God forbid, out of control, uh, or, or, or the world is outside of his control. So, as, how many dimensions did we talk about so far? Two. There's a third one coming, but I want to do just a little bit of background here. You keep me on time if I'm not. 
So the first is, what is our understanding of humanity? In order to understand this third dimension, you have to understand what is the Islamic conception of what a human being is? What is our nature as human beings? So we have a primary nature. This is our essential nature that we're all born with. Each one of us, if healthy and uh, nurtured properly, we have an innate knowledge of right and wrong. Each of us feels guilt. This isn't a socially constructed thing, right? Each of us knows inside of ourselves when we do something wrong, and we feel a sense of remorse against it. We also have this inclination towards something that is good and true and beautiful, right? That our primary nature finds the beautiful attractive, and that the ugly is repulsive, right? Uh, and the same applies to <coughs> actions, right? There's a reason that in almost all of human history, you had until very recently, you have these stories in which the hero gets the bad guy at the end and everybody, now we have the anti-hero, right? Or the bad guy gets away at the end, right? That's a, that's a recent modern phenomenon. But everybody knows that that is resonant with human nature. We want to see those things. We want to see good victorious over evil. So that's our primary nature. But there is also another aspect of ourselves, right? We have a selfish ego as well. So while we incline to that which is good and beautiful and true, we also have a capacity, perhaps even I'd use the word a tendency, towards being vengeful and preoccupied with our bodily pleasures. Okay? Now, so we have these two aspects working at the same time. We then have a third, which is God endowed us with reason. That human beings, uh, to borrow Aristotle's term, that we're rational animals. That what distinguishes us from the rest of, of creation is that we have the faculty of reason. And so reason is supposed to help us to listen to our primary nature and to be in control of our selfish ego, right? So you can even think of a basic encounter with a cheesecake, right? <laughs> the mind tells you, do not touch, don't go there, right? <clears throat> but the appetite is there. Okay? Now, if, you're, if your faculty of reason is stronger than your appetite, then you have to say, oh, well, that you've got a lot of discipline. You're disciplined. But those are training grounds for moral discipline. That's why Muslims fast. It's one of the reasons we fast. They're all related. The seven deadly sins, gluttony is one of them for a reason. If you're gluttonous with food, what does that mean with everything else? Nobody ever has just one deadly sin. Right? Even though one is enough to kill you, they say, right? <laughs> Nobody just has one because, of, because they're interrelated. Now, to get to the third dimension, it's character. It's building this character. So, there is a process that, that is termed in Islamic uh, literature as a purification of the soul. It's a process by which a Muslim struggles and strives, this is the greater jihad that Mike uh, uh, referred to, against the lower desires of their soul to purge these tendencies of the ego that I resist and I fight against my temper and my jealousy and my selfishness. And I work to endow myself with more beautiful virtues. I try to be more generous and more forgiving and more kind and more altruistic. And this process is the way in which I purify my soul. Now, part of this also entails an understanding of how we engage the world itself, right? That when it comes to the world, religion obviously has a lot to say. The Muslim understanding would be that we are neither we are in the world, but we're not of the world, right? That we engage the world, uh, as as one of the great sages of Islam said, it's to have the money in your hand, but not in your heart. So you don't live a life of rejection of the world. We don't go and live in monasteries. We're here in Pleasanton, California, working jobs, and we have houses, but we're not here to enjoy this this place. That's not the very purpose. The place is a bridge. It's a means to an end. This is a spiritual uh, laboratory, if you will, in which we're supposed to exercise and work as a training ground for the afterlife. And so we go between this, the two extremes of indulgence on the one hand uh, and uh, rejection. So again, just to recap, Islam views itself as a culmination of previous religious traditions, the final brick, as it were, in God's long uh, successive revelation. Uh, if, if one surrenders to God, we believe it will bring peace and harmony to the individual and to society as a whole. And it sees itself as a, as a middle road of bringing together the great virtues of previous traditions. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the Jewish tradition is known to have a great, rich legal tradition, rabbinical tradition. Uh, but Jesus came to remind us, right, 
that the spirit of the law is greater than the letter of the law as well. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we believe merges these two and brings each in its right place. That there is a, there is a as Hina talked about, we have sharia, we believe in a letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, those six objectives, the preservation of life and religion and intellect and family and property and honor, all of those things, that that stays at the center of it all. And so we balance ourselves as surrendering to God with our minds in terms of what we believe, with our bodies in terms of the fact that we pray and we refrain from doing anything that harms another person or stealing, um, and then with our souls because we uh, work on purifying ourselves, purging ourselves of our ego's tendencies, and adorning uh, the, the, the virtues uh, of the heart. Um, I thank you for attention. This sort of was just a summary slide. Thank you for your time, and thank you for just being here today.